Well, we're happy to have you here today, and I'm looking forward to sharing some exciting things with you. What is New Start? Well, some of you may have an idea, but let's explore that topic together. I want to see how observant you are, and I want you to look at this picture we have here, and I want you to tell me what country that picture was taken in. I'm going to test your powers of observation. Any? Colombia? No, no, it's... No, no, it's not that obvious. You got to look carefully. No. Where? Italy? No. England. That's right. You see the pound sign. Okay. By the way, that was taken in Herod's department store. They have very nice food displays. And whenever I travel and I see things that I can use in my lectures, I take pictures of them. Well, learn to naturally reverse the effects of adult onset diabetes. Are you beginning to realize that lifestyle makes a little difference? Well, you are here because you have realized in your life that maybe you should do some things differently. Are you in agreement with that? Now, there's maybe you need to change. And that's why we have this here. You have to change the way you think before you're going to change the way that you are. In other words, if you think, well, everything's going right, I'm doing so well, I don't need to change. Are you going to change? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't think you need to change, you're not going to change. And that's what happens in interpersonal relationships oftentimes between spouses. <laughs> One spouse thinks the other spouse needs to change, and the one spouse who the other spouse wants to change doesn't I don't need to change what's wrong. I'm happy the way I am. You know, the other one says, that's why I'm so unhappy. Well, no. <laughs> so, in other words, unless you realize you need to change, you're not going to change. And I'm happy that all of you came to that conclusion before you got here, because if you didn't realize that, you probably wouldn't be here, right? So that's good news. And the other thing is, your health does not just happen. It happens because of everything that you have done and everything that you haven't done. And you are responsible for your health. There are a few instances in life where we are not responsible for our health. And, you know, if you're born with certain problems, congenital uh, defects or problems, you know, then you're not responsible. But most of us, you know, in, as we've talked with you, as Dr. Lukens and I have talked with you, I think we have come to realize, and we're trying to help you realize, that the health problems or challenges which you have are because of your lifestyle choices and the way that you have done things. So, you have responsibility, you need to assume that responsibility, and if so, you you need to make some changes to get better. So our objectives for you are, I want you to know who was helped by New Start, what does New Start mean, how are you going to benefit from New Start, and does your attitude make a difference? Attitude, the way that you think, okay? And how about the most common causes of death for the world and the United States? And is there any association, any relationship between the way that you live and the diabetes, or the high blood pressure, or the high cholesterol, or being too short, okay? And is there any relationship between food and disease? We'll explore those this afternoon. And how about, uh, does your weight make a difference as far as your health goes? Well, not if it's in proper proportion to your height, but if it's out of proportion, then it may make a difference. And why do you like to eat certain things? What are the factors that influence your appetite? And May will explain in more detail the impact of obesity on health. And we're going to talk about the importance of breakfast as well. So let's get started. Well, I'm told that in, in not too long from now we're going to have an election. So I want you to practice voting right now. Uh, we're going to have a little election here, and you've got three choices. And the rules of this election you are, you only get one vote, and the majority rules, and you have to vote. Voting is compulsory. 
So there's no one who can sit on their hand. You've got to vote. So choice number one is, do you want our staff to only teach you what is good? That's choice number one. Choice number two is, do you want us to teach you what is better, which includes what is good? And choice number three, do you want us to teach you what is best, which of course includes uh, what is good and what is better? So all those who only want us to teach you what is good, would you raise a hand? No hands. Those who want what is better, would you raise a hand? No. Those who want what is best, would you raise a hand? Okay. You have asked for what is best, and we will teach you what is best as we work with you during this time. Now, what is best is based upon sound medical evidence, evidence-based medicine, and that's what we will use. You know, the latest scientific research and papers about how to work with different types of diseases. We're also going to use the experience, the experience of working literally with hundreds and probably thousands of patients and people that we've talked to and lectured to throughout the years, between Dr. Lukens, myself, and my wife, and all the people that we've talked to and counseled throughout the years. And the other exciting and awesome thing is that some of the principles that we're going to share with you about health are eternal principles found in a very fascinating book. Do you know what that book is? The Bible. The Bible, that's right. Some of the principles of health that we're going to share with you are found in the Bible. So that's very awesome. Now, May's fortune cookies. Well, I guess by now you've realized that I'm Asian, right? <laughs> and in Asian society, your children are your fortune. You've also come to realize that my wife's name is Mays. So that gives me a reason to show you a picture of our five children. Now, originally when I did this at first, my wife was not really too pleased with me showing a picture of our children because she says, what do you want to show a picture of the kids for? I mean, you know, you're just trying to... No. show off or something? I said, no, no. I said, no. I said, the reason I want to show a picture of the children, well, someone told her this. She says, Mrs. Zang, if your husband never showed us a picture of your children telling us that they were raised on a plant-based diet, I would not believe that you could be strong and healthy raised on only plant foods. They were raised on a plant-based diet from the time that they were born. They have never eaten any meat or fish or chicken unless they were served it and they didn't know about it, you know, and they ate it before, you know, they knew. Because from the time that they were born, we only gave them plant foods, minimal dairy products and minimal eggs in the time that they were raised and they were growing, but never any meat, fish, or chicken. So, uh, and, you know, when they were small or younger, when they were younger, they used to say, our relatives used to say, your children are so skinny and so short because you won't feed them any meat, fish, or chicken. Well, my oldest son is six foot three, my daughter is five foot seven, and all the other boys are my height or taller. And now my relatives and the friends would ask us, how come your kids are so tall? I said, that's because they never ate any meat, fish, or chicken. <laughs> See, it's the same answer. What happens is they, their growth spurt is later in life, like about 15 and 16, and they grow for a longer period of time. And the other advantage for girls is that they start to menstruate at a later age, menarche, is a medical term, and the advantage of starting menarche at a later age is lowered risk for breast cancer later on in life. So my daughter, she didn't start to menstruate till she was 16, almost 17. And so that is very, very good. So uh, in the children, I have two, three, three doctors. He's a physician, internal medicine, subspecialty infectious diseases. Uh, He's an electrical engineer, he's an ophthalmologist, she's a veterinarian, and he's a businessman. That was the date of my youngest son's wedding a few years ago. So again, plant-based diet, that's really the best food for all of you. Now, in Diabetes Educator, in 2004, four years ago, January, February, they had an article which told how we, 
manage and help people manage their diabetes. And it was a very, very, very good um, article. And we had 317 guests or participants. 217 had diabetes, 94 with obesity. And what we found out is those who had diabetes, the average or the mean blood sugar at the start was 150 milligrams per deciliter, and it came down to 30. Well, you say 30 is still not normal, but that's, remember, that's the average, okay? So there's some higher and some lower. And the cholesterol came down 40 points, their weight came down 21 pounds, their exercise time increased. But see, the mean now is below what's diagnostic for diabetes, because diagnostic for diabetes is 126 milligrams per deciliter or higher. And after three months, the people who came through the program had put into practice the principles that we're going to share with you, and four out of 10 or 40% of those with diabetes type two were able to control their blood sugar without having to use any medicines at all with the lifestyle changes which we are teaching and sharing with you. Now, I'm gonna show you a picture of one of our New Start guests. This was Tom. Tom came to us in 19, excuse me, and he, he was 58 years old and he came to see us in 2003. And that was because he didn't really feel too good and he really wanted to get to his 60th birthday. He wasn't sure he was going to make it because he had diabetes, he had high blood pressure, and even though he was six foot four inches tall, he was about two and a half feet too short because he weighed two, excuse me, 381.4 pounds. And for that weight, he needed to be about eight feet nine inches tall. And he was only six foot four inches tall. And even though he wanted to grow taller, he wasn't gonna grow taller at 58 years of age. So we had to help him lose some weight. He had his medicines for his blood uh, diabetes and his blood pressure. He lost 16 pounds in 18 days. He lost uh, by January 7, which is five months later, he lost 83 pounds. His hemoglobin A1C is now normal. That's that of a person without diabetes. And oh, by the way, his blood pressure was normal within the 18 days, no longer needed medicine for his, his blood pressure. And by the end of September, six weeks later, he could stop his medicine for his diabetes and he had normal blood sugars. Well, he lost 111 pounds by May, and by November he'd lost 139 pounds. And here he is on my front porch, January 23, what, that is about 17 months later, weighing 240 pounds, lost 141.4 pounds. Tom's a dentist, and when people come to see him who haven't seen him for a while, as they're sitting there in their chair and he strides into the room and they look up and they say, who are you? Where's my dentist? He says, well, I'm your dentist. And they say, what happened to you? He says, well, there's less of me. I went to a place called New Start and uh, there's 141 pounds less of me. And he's very, very happy about that. Exercise has become a part of his regular lifestyle. Now, Ron's another gentleman who came with a problem. He had diabetes. He had a heart attack previously. He weighed as much as 287 pounds. And when he came here, he had lost a little weight. He was down to 265 pounds. But before he came here, you know, he would go see his cardiologist and his heart specialist. His heart specialist would say, Ron, you're a great patient. We really like you. Uh, you pay your bills very well. And please come back and see us every three months. And go on home and relax and enjoy yourself. They didn't say anything else, but what was the rest of the sentence that they left out? Until you what? Until you die, that's right. But Ron says, there's got to be something else I can do. And then someone told him about New Start, so he came to New Start. He arrived in April of 99. He lost 16 pounds. And he's gotten down to as low as um, 190 pounds. He's probably somewhere around 200 pounds right now. And at the time he came to the program, it cost him about $5,000 a little bit less than what you're paying because there's been a little inflation since then. Well, he figured because he came to the program, he's going to live another 12 to 15 years. And at 
his retirement benefits and pay and his pension, $30,000 a year times 12 is $360,000, okay? You divide that by um, 5,000, his investment in the program, that's a 72-fold return on his investment. Do you know any investment in the stock market or in the real estate market where you're gonna get a 72-fold return on your investment? That's what Ron did. So I want you to think that you have invested time and money as you are coming to this program. Oh, that's one of my granddaughters. Her name is Stephanie. What do you think her father's name is? Stephen. Oh, you're so smart. That's right. His, his name is Stephen. Now, this is my oldest grandson. And he's the very special child because uh, to be politically correct, you say special. But... To be more specific, he's severely handicapped because he is totally blind. He cannot see anything. He has no muscle control. He's now, he's, he was born one day before Stephanie was, okay? Stephanie is perfectly normal. They're both about 10 years of age. But Stephanie can run and jump and play, but Ryan can't do any of that. Ryan needs a very special treatment. It's called the twinkling of an eye treatment. Now, do any of you know when that treatment will be available? Jesus That's right. That will be available at the second coming of Christ. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we shall be changed from mortal to immortal. That's right. And Ryan will then be made whole. He'll be able to run, jump, play, sing, you know, and we'll be able to know whether or not he has understood many of the things that we have said to him. Uh, throughout these years. We do know he hears very well because when they sing together at family worship, you can see the beautiful smile on his face. So we know that he hears and he also responds to tactile stimuli. So the reason I want to tell you this is because I don't want you to be caught unawares. The second coming of Christ may come sooner than some of you think and I don't want you to be caught without knowing that it's very, very soon. Okay, now, as we look at some of the health problems that we face in the world, what are the health problems the world faces? Lack of food, unsafe sex, high blood pressure, smoking, alcohol, unsafe water or sanitation, high cholesterol, nutritional deficiencies. And oh, by the way, I want to, I want to define what unsafe sex is. Unsafe sex is sex with anyone other than your spouse in which both spouses are faithful to each other. Is that clear? If one spouse is not faithful, it's not safe. So both spouses must be faithful and it's only when you, it's between spouses, okay? So that's what causes lots of the problems uh, in the world, all of these different things. Now the World Health Organization, Food and Agriculture Organization said, what do we need to do to improve the world's health? Less saturated fats, less sugar and salt, more food and vegetables, and at least one hour of activity of moderate intensity a day are key factors in fighting chronic disease. Walking meets that definition, moderate intensity, okay? Now, it says less saturated fat. What's the most common source of saturated fat in the diet, in our food? What? Meat, that's right, meat. Animal fat and protein, most common source of saturated fat in the diet of people in this world. Very, very true. In fact, many deaths in the world are due to high blood pressure, high cholesterol levels, obesity, and low levels of physical activity. And that's why so many people in the world and in the United States are dying from what we call chronic diseases. The number one cause of death in the world, cardiovascular disease. Number two, high blood pressure. Number three, cancer. Number four, uh, deaths related to the use of tobacco. Um, people who smoke have more heart disease, they have more lung disease, they have more lung cancer. And of course, we get down again to high cholesterol. And again, the only source of cholesterol in our diet is going to be found in what types of foods? Animal foods. You'll never find cholesterol in peanuts 
or avocados or olives or nuts or seeds. You're only going to find cholesterol in meat and fish, chicken, eggs, you know, egg yolks, dairy products. That's right. And again, unsafe sex uh, is responsible for some of the HIV infections and so on and other problems as well. Well, now as we look at the United States, the United States problems specifically too much food and not enough exercise which leads to obesity, uh, high blood pressure, smoking, alcohol, high cholesterol, sedentary lifestyle, and again unsafe sex. These are some of the problems that cause some of the activities that cause our health problems here in the US. And again, as we look at good plant-based food, does any of this food have cholesterol? Not at all. That's right. Now, some of you, when you thought about coming to Weimar, you said, yes, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'd really like to get better, but I'm afraid. I'm very fearful. I'm afraid that you're going to take away my favorite food. <laughs> It's going to make me feel so sad because I can't eat it anymore. And uh, I'm going to have to get out and get all sweaty and, you know, because I'm going to have to exercise and you're going to take all the fun out of life. Well, is that really true? Absolutely not because our goal, the goal of preventive medicine, the goal of the New Start program is to give you more life to enjoy the fun. And in our experience, if you will incorporate these principles into your life, to your lifestyle, you should have a much happier, more healthful, more enjoyable life, better quality of life, and I assure you, you're going to feel better. There's some more of that good, some more of that good food, that good fruit again. And now, as you look at your life and review and look back at your life, is your life in balance? How has your lifestyle been? You know, we look at the right side of this. Uh, illustration, therapeutic medicine. And we look at therapeutic medicine and as we do that, therapeutic medicine kind of goes like this. You have an individual who has, um, he's out with, the, out with his family, they're on a, out on a picnic on a Sunday and he's playing baseball. And he gets one and he smashes the ball way out there and he starts to run. He gets the first base okay, he gets the second base, and as he's running between second and third base, suddenly he has some tightness in his chest and a heavy feeling and really a lot of pressure, and he's wondering what's happening. It really hurts. And so he stops, and he pauses, because isn't there a short stop between second and third base? So he stops there for a moment, and his wife is looking at him, wondering what happened, and he finally feels a little better, and he goes on home, and his wife says, hey, what happened out there? He says, well, I've really got some bad chest pain. You know, this gentleman's, uh, he's about 50, and he's about six foot tall, and he weighs 270 pounds. He's a little bit short. And his wife says, well, I think you need to go down and see the, see your doctor, see the doctor. So he walks into the doctor's office, and the doctor says, well, what happened? So he tells him the story. He says, well, you need to come see my friendly cardiologist. So the, he goes down to see the cardiologist, and the cardiologist says, well, I'm so happy to see you. Please get on our treadmill here. We'll connect you up. Uh, and so they connect him up to the treadmill. He does the treadmill. He says, according to what I see, it looks like your heart may not be getting enough blood. I've got a very good table down here at the hospital where we can do a special test on you. So he, he goes down to the hospital, and before he has any of the tests, and he has to sign permission. He says, Doc, what are all these permissions for? He says, angioplasty, what's that? Well, he says, if you've got a narrowed spot in the artery, you can put on a little device to inflate it to make the opening bigger. And uh, what's this other one, coronary artery bypass grafts? Well, that's in case we have some problems and if things don't work right, we can't do the angioplasty, that we may have to do emergency bypass surgery. You've got to give us permission for that. He says, really? And, you know, and it goes on and on and on. Well, I had a friend like that. His brother suddenly died from a heart attack. He went in and, and he had the coronary artery bypass grafts. A few days later, you know, after a week or so in the hospital, he goes home. And after he goes home, he's doing okay, except his legs start to swell. And he goes back to see the doctor, and his doctor says, 
Oh, Sam, I'm sorry. It looks like you've got some infected donor graft sites. You're going to have to stay in the hospital a while longer. So he stays in for a few more weeks, and then he finally goes home. And after a few weeks, he, uh, he goes back home. And then every few days, all of his food comes back up. And so he goes back to see the doctor again. And the doctor says, oh, Sam, I'm really sorry. It looks like you've got a stress ulcer. But that's OK. I've got a friendly surgeon. He can put a little tube in there so you don't have to eat your food anymore. We just pour it in a tube and wait till your ulcer heals up. Well, that took three or four months. And then finally, Sam gets all back together, and as all his hospital bills come out to be about a quarter of a million dollars, $250,000. And he could have gone to 50 new starts for a quarter of a million dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and actually, the truth of the matter is, I really tried to persuade Sam to come to New Star, but he turned me down, broke my heart, broke his bank, <laughs> or broke the Medicare bank, whatever. Anyhow, New Star, what is that? That's an acronym. N is nutrition, E is exercise, W is water, S is sunshine, T is temperance. Temperance means using nothing which is bad for you and using in moderation that which is good. Can you think of something which you should never use? Mm -hmm. Alcohol, what else, anything else? Tobacco. tobacco, yeah, those are the main ones, alcohol and tobacco. And the third one that we'll talk about sometime later is caffeinated beverages, okay? You notice we haven't served you any coffee or tea while you were here. There's a reason, okay? Air, rest, and last, and probably most important, trusting God. The better you know him, the more you will trust him. Well, one of my classmates at Loma Linda, Dr. Lamont Murdoch, said this, faulty genetics loads the gun, lifestyle pulls the trigger. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, the significance is, depending on what diseases your daddy and mommy had, you may be at higher risk for those diseases. But just because they had them, you don't necessarily have to get them. For example, in my family history, my daddy and mommy both had high blood pressure, and they both had type 2 diabetes. But they both lived a little bit differently than I did. They did exercise, but they were a little bit overweight, a little bit short, and they were not on a plant-based diet. So I've decided to do things differently. Uh, by the time they were the age that I am now, they both had had diabetes and high blood pressure for a number of years. And I don't have diabetes or high blood pressure. And I'm hoping and praying that with my healthy lifestyle and the good Lord's grace, I won't get it. So again, your lifestyle makes a big difference. Loma Linda University, the motto of Loma Linda University is to make man whole. Total restoration is what we're talking about. Now, what does your lifestyle include? Only what you do? Everything. Everything you do? How about what you don't do? Right. Does it include that as well? Are there some things that you don't do that maybe you should do? Exercise, that's right. And it's good that there's some things that you don't do, like use alcohol and tobacco, right? That's right. Your lifestyle includes everything you do and what you don't do. I told you I was going to ask you this question. Today is the first day of all the rest. True or false? True. Now the question, the answer that I want is how long is all the rest? We don't know how long is all the rest. It's up to us. It's up to you. That's true. But how long can all the rest be? How long? Oh, forever. Forever. For eternity. In other words, would it be appropriate if I say today is the first day of the rest of eternity? Is that true? Okay. Now, how long can you live? Till you die. Till you die. Well, do you have to die? Today is the first day of the rest of eternity. How long were you designed to live for? 70 years? How long were we designed to live for? Forever. God created and designed us to live forever. God offers to us something called the gift of eternal life. If you're not sure about that, 
I encourage you to talk to Viola, who does our Fresh Start, or talk to May. They'll be happy to study with you to help answer that question. And the other thing is, if you have any doubt about whether God has a plan for your life, I assure you that he does, but if you're not sure, talk to either one of them, and they'll be happy to study with you to help you find out what God's plan is for your life, okay? So how long you live is up to you. You need to choose wisely, okay? And it's never too late to change. It's never too late to eat right, even though you may have been eating less than healthfully all your life. And it's never too late to get started on a good exercise program. And those are really important things that will improve and optimize your health. So the question that I want to ask you, are you willing to do that, willing to make those changes, to do things differently than you've done before so that you can improve and optimize your health? And if you have diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease, we can get those under control. How about it? Fair enough? Okay. So get fit. Watch your weight go down if it's too high. Drink less. In fact, they actually drink zero things like uh, soda pop and um, alcoholic beverages, coffee, tea, and things like that. Drink more water and learn to relax. Don't get up so tight. Okay? So what you've done in the past can't be changed. The important thing is what you're going to do today and for all the rest of your life. Today, tomorrow, and all the rest. That's what's important. And you can do something differently if you are willing to and if you choose to. So to help you change, we need to help you understand why you should make those changes. And that's what our lectures and program is designed to do, to help you understand what you need to do and why you should do it. Okay? Now, your health is a function of your lifestyle, the way that you live, what you do and what you don't do. You are the one who chooses how you're going to live. The choice is always yours. And how are you going to choose to live? You know, sometimes you go out and someone says, well, but they gave me the food. But just because they gave it to you, you don't have to eat it. You're the one who put it in your mouth, see? You didn't have to put it in your mouth. But it looks so good, you know? <laughs> And I really wanted it even though I knew it wasn't good for me. But see, that was your choice. So you've got to learn to be more discriminating and choose wisely. Now, it's what, not what you know, but what you do with what you know. Because if you know what to do and you don't do it, it's not going to do you any good. So now you're going to begin to learn things, and I'm hoping that you choose to put them into practice. And for some of those things which are a little bit harder to do for us, like um, if you like to eat between meals, eat at any time, it may be hard for you to stop eating between meals. And if you like to have a midnight snack and you're used to having that, you know, uh, like I've had patients that, well, just before I go to bed, I have a nice bowl of ice cream. And they wondered why their cholesterol was real high and why they were too, sh too short, I mean too wide or, you know, too abundant. And I said, it's because of that ice cream you eat every night. So you need to do something differently. Well, if you're having trouble doing some of those things, talk to the good Lord. It's who you know, because he can help you do what you need to do. And that's really important, okay? Now, how about your attitude? Does your attitude make a difference? The way you think, what about it? For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Well, that's not a gender-specific verse because I'm sure as a lady thinks in her heart, that's also important. But just think about this for a few moments. The longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude is more important than the past, education, than money, circumstances, failures, successes, than what other people think or say or do. Attitude is more important than appearance, giftedness, or skill. That's right. It's more important than if you're handsome or you're beautiful. Attitude will make or break a company, a church, a home, a relationship. The remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. You can't change the past. You cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. 
You cannot change the inevitable. Oh, by the way, uh, there, there is one person that you really can't change. You know who that is? your spouse. <laughs> if you haven't learned that lesson yet, it's important for you to learn that lesson. You can't change your spouse. Now, I didn't say your spouse didn't need, to ch didn't need to be changed, but I said you can't change your spouse, okay? And you really can't change your boss. The only thing we can do is play in the one string we have, and that is our attitude. I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me, and 90% how I react to it. And so it is with you. We're in charge of our attitude. So the question that I want to ask you, you know, are you going to have a good day or a bad day? How are you going to choose to live? Well, personally, I like only good days and I don't like bad days. And I think it's a lot easier to have good days and bad days. And how about looking at it this way? If you don't wake up in the morning, you don't have to worry about it, right? And if you wake up in the morning, it's going to be a good day. Fair enough? I mean, after all, look at it. You know, before you came here, the night before you came here, unless you spent it at the airport, but I'm assuming you were home, the night before you came here, you had a bed to sleep in. You had a roof over your head. You had some food in the refrigerator or the pantry. Uh, and, you know, you had heat in the house if it was cold, or if it was too hot, you had something to cool it off or a fan. And you know that makes you better than probably several billion other people in the world who don't have it that good. And, you know, are you grateful or thankful for that? So like I said, if you wake up in the morning, it's going to be a good day. And if you didn't get as much sleep as you wanted, well, I'm sorry, then you need to go to bed earlier the night before. But it's still going to be a good day, especially if you choose to have a good day. So remember that. Now, people who have control over their lifestyle behaviors, like all of you do, you know, you're going to be healthier and happier. You can choose whether or not you're going to smoke, right? You can choose what you're going to drink and when you're going to drink, what you're going to eat and what you're not going to eat. So it's important now to make good choices and to exercise the choice that God has given to us, to make wise choices, okay? Now, how about being obese or overweight? Well, that's really a serious health problem because the cost of being overweight, being obese, uh, even outweighs that of smoking. So being overweight is really something we want to avoid and it's really important to do that. Talking about health care cost, it adds almost $93 billion to our health care cost. And that's a lot of money. Now, what type of food, what type of nutrition would we recommend? A healthy diet has low levels of saturated fat, which would mean you would eat more what type of foods? More plant foods. Low levels of cholesterol, so again, you want to go away from foods containing cholesterol or animal foods. And if you have a healthier diet with less cholesterol, you'll have less risk of cognitive decline. In other words, less risk of senile dementia, less risk of Alzheimer's. And those are some diseases that I think all of us would rather avoid, right? Now, people who eat a plant-based diet usually weigh less than people who eat meat, fish, and chicken. Vegetarians have a healthier body weight than non-vegetarians. They also have lower rates of death from heart disease and lower cholesterol levels. They have less high blood pressure, and they have less diabetes, and they have less prostate cancer and less colon cancer. And that was said by Cynthia Sass, a registered dietitian, and American Dietetic Association spokesperson. Now, 65.4% of adult Americans are overweight. I say too short. Uh, so in others, you know, they weigh too much. And that's a common problem that we face in our society. Uh, 1.7 million American lives are lost annually due to premature deaths linked to diseases that are associated with being overweight. Now, 
the other thing for those of you who need to manage your weight, you need to make, you need to make a conscious choice and realize that this choice is not just for a few weeks or months, but it's for a lifetime. In other words, every day and every time you eat and every day when you need to exercise, you've got to realize I have made a choice to manage my weight, to get my weight under control. Therefore, it means that I'm going to eat certain types of foods at certain times, and I'm going to do certain activities like exercise. And probably one of the most important exercises for those who weigh too much is pushing yourself back from the table a little bit sooner and not cleaning off your plate. But my mommy taught me that when I was a little child, there's all those starving children over somewhere else, right, in Africa or, you know, the islands somewhere. Well, but you eating that food is not going to help those children. You've got to understand that. And you want it to go to waste, W-A-S-T-E, not to waste, W-A-I-S-T, your waste. So you need to make a conscious choice to eat less and push yourself back from the table a little bit sooner, and that will help. Dr. Clive McKay was a professor of nutrition at Cornell University, and he was a very astute professor. One of his students gave him a book one day, and uh, it was a book written by a lady. Her name was Mrs. White, and after he read the book, here's what Dr. McKay said about that book. In spite of the fact that the writings of Mrs. White were written long before the advent of modern scientific nutrition, no better overall guide is available today. That's a very interesting statement by this professor of nutrition. Now, have you ever heard of Nathan Pritikin? Well, Nathan Pritikin was an engineer by background and training, and somewhere in the latter 70s, he was not feeling very well. He went to see his heart specialist, and his heart specialist says, Mr. Pritikin, according to our exams, your cholesterol is very high, very have diagnosed that you have heart disease, and again, there's not too much we can do for you. Well, Mr. Pritikin said, there's got to be something that can be done. So he went and he researched the medical literature. And he found out that if you took rabbits, which normally only eat plants, and you gave them cholesterol, lo and behold, these rabbits got arteries that were plugged up and they got heart disease. So then he wondered if you took the cholesterol away from the rabbits, what would happen with their narrowed arteries? So he took the cholesterol away from the rabbits, and lo and behold, those arteries that were narrowed, they opened up. And so he said, I wonder if that will work on people. And so that's how he got started. And he also read something that Ellen White wrote, and here's what he said. I think that if you want to get to the originator of the proper diet, you have to go back to Ellen White. She laid guidelines that unfortunately are not being adhered to as strictly as they should be. Very interesting statement by Nathan Pritikin. Dr. George Mann from Vanderbilt University and Dr. Frederick Steer from the Harvard School of Public Health said this, in our opinion, nutrition is the most important single environmental factor affecting health. The food that you eat here in the U.S. has probably a greater impact on your health than anything else that you will come in contact with in our environment. And that is absolutely true. So if our food the wrong kind of food can cause problems. Maybe the right type of food may help us get rid of some of these problems. So let thy food be thy medicine, okay? Now how about, how important is your food? Can food affect the way you think? Food affect the way you feel? And food affect the way that you relate to other people? Well, have you ever eaten something that gave you an upset stomach? Maybe just a little gas and a little uh, indigestion, or maybe even worse, a little uh, nausea and or vomiting, or maybe even a little worse, even a little diarrhea, you know, as in bad food poisoning. Now, can you imagine if you were somewhere in between, not really bad, you know, it could be so bad you're going both ways, that someone would come to you and ask you for some advice, or you would had a difficult problem to solve, would you be able to do it at that time? No. I mean, if you're in pain and you're vomiting and you have diarrhea, there's no way you could answer those person's questions, all because of something that you had eaten. 
So you see how important food is. If you've got an important talk or presentation, you need to eat the right kind of food so that you can do your talk appropriately. Beloved, you are God's beloved. I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospereth. 3 John 2. The Lord wants you to have good health. And he's made every provision for that for each one of us. So changing your diet from eating animal protein to eating plant, a plant-based diet will make a big difference in your life and in your health. So the guidelines that I want you to use as you select and make food choices are the following five words. Whole plant foods eaten whole. Five words, five letters for each word. Very simple to uh, understand and to follow. Now, tell me, does um, roast beef fill come under that classification of whole plant foods? How about scrambled eggs? Would that come under that definition? How about scrambled tofu? Would that be a whole plant food? Yeah, that would be okay. But you, in other words, uh, KFC and hamburgers and roast beef doesn't meet our definition of whole plant foods. Well, see, whole plant foods would kind of be your definition for uh, your guidelines. Now, that would be your bachelor's in nutrition. If you want a doctorate in nutrition from New Start University, I suggest you add the following. Whole plant foods eaten whole at regular times with nothing between meals in sufficient quantity to attain and maintain your ideal weight. Now, how does that sound? That can be the essence of what you need in the area of nutrition. Whole plant foods eaten whole at regular times with nothing between meals in sufficient quantity to attain and maintain your ideal weight. So that's very good. Now, uh, as we look at health, the Apostle Paul wrote something for us in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. The very God of peace sanctify you completely or holy. I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's a whole person. You have a physical nature, you have a spiritual nature, and you have a mental or emotional nature. And to have total health and restoration, we need to deal with and work with all of these natures in addressing your health needs. That's Loma Linda University. And one other thing that we talk about, uh, how we eat and drink is important. That's very true. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. I used to think that this only applied to what we eat and drink, but I realized that there was a very important word that I was overlooking in that verse, and that was this word, whatever. Does whatever leave anything out? So everything we do or don't do can either honor or dishonor God. That's important to recognize. Can you trust your appetite? Is appetite a safe guide? Usually you like foods because they do what? Taste. Taste good. And you don't really distinguish before you got here. You didn't care whether it was good for you. All you wanted to know was that it tasted what? Tasted good, that's right. So we can't really trust our appetite. That's important. Now, can we safely be guided by the customs of society? Yeah. No, because the customs of American society say, what do we need to be strong and healthy? Meat and, milk and eggs. <laughs> meat and potatoes or meat and eggs, right? Dairy. Meat, eggs, dairy, that's right. That's what they say. And that's, you know, when I was a child, that's what I was raised on, you know. The milkman would deliver the milk every day or every couple of days, you know, and, you know, meat. Eggs, I like rice better than potatoes. Now, the disease and suffering that everywhere prevail are largely due to popular errors in regard to diet. And that's a popular error. You need meat and potatoes, eggs and dairy products to be strong and healthy. And that really is not the best diet as we have learned. Actually, your diet should be primarily carbohydrates, cereal grains, root vegetables and fruits. 
should contain fat. That's right, you can get vegetable sources of fat from nuts, seeds, olives, and avocados. And you can get protein from plant sources. And you're already learning what those plant sources of protein are. What are the most common sources of um, protein in plant foods? You have legumes. Legumes include things like uh, beans and peas and lentils and garbanzos, things like that. So those are excellent sources of plant protein, as well as cereal grains also have protein in it, as well as carbohydrate. So your carbohydrates have cereal grains um, and root vegetables and fruits. Now, Regular exercise is going to lower your risk of getting diabetes by 50%. And have you ever thought about the people who are at risk for getting diabetes? Well, let me tell you who they are so you'll be more inclined to exercise. Anyone who is non-Caucasian is at higher risk for getting diabetes. That means blacks, Asians, Pacific Islanders, the Latinos, okay? And anyone whose father, mother, brother, or sister had diabetes is at higher risk. Anyone who is over the age of 45, anyone who is overweight, anyone who has high cholesterol or high blood pressure, all of these people are at higher risk. And any lady who had a baby that weighed more than nine pounds at birth or had diabetes during pregnancy is at higher risk. So the only people not at risk are skinny Caucasians less than the age of 45 whose father and mother didn't have diabetes, who don't have high blood pressure, you know, and if it was a woman who didn't have a baby that weighed more than nine pounds at birth or didn't have uh, diabetes during pregnancy. Everyone else is at risk. So if you are at risk, if you exercise regularly, you're going to lower your risk for getting diabetes by 50%. So please note, the standard American diet is sad. It's high in fat, refined carbohydrates, and has too much protein in it that we don't need. God's life-activating diet includes whole plant foods, eaten whole, no snacking and avoiding meat, fish, chicken, eggs, and dairy products. That's really the best diet. Okay, so something better. <clears throat> Principle number one. Eat a wholesome and balanced breakfast large enough to provide one-third to one-half of the day's nutrient requirements. So these are some of the things we will be talking about as we go on. So you want to have breakfast like a what? King. Lunch like a prince. And supper like a pauper. So what should be your largest meal of the day? Breakfast. And that's the one that we most often skip. So I think with that we'll stop here and I'm going to continue with this later on because this comes into how to energize your life. Any questions?